We out of red in England. All the boy, yeah, you know it's hype train FC. Modern ambition, we got blue and gold in our kit. Plus, you know we the champs of the league. And we don't quit. Started from rest, who's scared of sport? We ain't taking it light. You know it's real. From fantasy to the field, you better believe that hype. Yeah, yeah. Hello one and all, my name is Robert Austin and a very warm welcome back to what will be the 13th edition of the Hype Train podcast. Today we have another special guest on board our podcast and we'll be interviewing another manager from Sunday League, James Mekendo. He's from Brothers United and what I'm really looking to talk to with James is all about brothers and their development. In the Reading scene, they're an up and coming and developing emerging team that started the same time as we did in the RDSL all the way back in 2021. So this will be a good opportunity to have them talk about their development as they've gone from Division 4 to Division 3 and to Division 2, which is one step above where we are currently in the RDSL structure. So um, brothers are a very well-organized team. They have just recently beat us 9-0 after we beat them a couple of times, 5-0 and 2-0 in our very first season. So the turnaround at brothers for me has been completely spectacular. They're completely on the upward curve. So this is a really good opportunity for me to ask some questions with James that are all about how he and his team are getting from point A to B and improving along the way, which is ultimately what we as football club owners, football club players and volunteers all want to be progressing to. So let's strap in. I hope you enjoy the podcast. And before we get going into it, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel and give us a like on the video as well. It means the world to me and all of the team at Hype Train that are getting this podcast under away hi everyone rob from hype train podcast here and i am with james from brothers uh before we go any further james do you want to give yourself a short introduction for everybody yeah hello yes james uh from brothers united i'm the club secretary and coach and yeah the organizer of the team i guess Oh uh, yeah, that's the uh, the broad strokes way of saying you do ninety nine percent of all of the <laughs> the club's admin in the background. Yes, and yeah. So um, the reason I wanted you on today, James, was that your team brothers um, and ourselves both started in twenty twenty one. In was it twenty twenty one? Twenty one, twenty two. Yep. So we've been in the RDSL, the Reading Sunday League, now for our third season. And each season, I've been noticing, and other clubs have been noticing a steady progression with your team and I really wanted to be able to pick your brain just about how you guys have been developing and growing especially because this podcast is aimed at new football teams that want to uh, grow from day one or mainly learning about experiences from people within the grassroots scene about you know how they organize how they uh, fend on the pitch because you know grassroots football is becoming harder to organize more costly so it's always good to be able to lean on our experiences to help other people. Um, So we'll go straight into basically just the basics of your club. So brothers were formed in 2021. Talk to me about the how it came about. How did brothers kind of get off the ground? Um, It was just a a group of friends who were playing football. And then because of COVID um, and the breakaway, we decided to sort of bring everyone back together together. sort of help everyone's sort of physical and mental well-being because I think it's really beneficial sort of playing and getting that group of group of friends back together and and um, establishing a team. So before you guys, um, so th- was this your first venture as a football team? So was it just a group of friends beforehand that liked football? Was this the actual step that you took to become a team? Effectively, yeah, we did some small-sided games um and we sort of did a like a friends mini league um with that um but it was all small sided uh, football um this is the first adventure into 11 aside yeah so um you joined in 2021 was it always your ambition to become a sunday league team based on the group that you had is it did you what was your like kind of motivation then when you started the team um was it just to get the people playing or was it to at the time did you think oh we can really make a go at the leagues did you really kind of like know the structures and what you were doing or did you just throw it at the wall and say we're just gonna have a better fun with our friends um it was a mixture of things i mean we, we went to sunday because of availability of everyone um sunday mornings are a lot easier than saturday afternoons um 
and then it was just really to get out there and have fun and sort of bring bring people together and bring the community together and sort of take it from there. Mm. Uh, Saturday teams are so difficult to run. We we run a Saturday team at Hype Train. Uh, it's uh, it's a nightmare sometimes trying to get people available for two p.m. on a Saturday. Um, we do try to. Um, I would love to play the games on a Saturday morning, but you know every under eighteen team in the UK plays around that time. So trying to find the pitch availability or the referees that would be on hand because every week I'm always said the same thing. All of my players always say, oh, if games were at 11 or 10, that would be so much easier. <clears throat> Likely it would all be available. So yeah, we, we always run into those issues, but largely we, you know, um, you do find the lads that will eventually like commit to your team um, and, you know, really get it going. So in the case of brothers, um, where you guys started, um, in the, your first season talk to me about your experience in your first year with your group of friends um, you were in a division RDSL with ourselves Hype Train and Reading United and Core FC um, who were the kind of teams at the top of the table talk to me about your experience running the club and being involved with your friends in the first season and kind of like what you learned from your experience um, it was a bit of a shock in terms of um, how big of the picture it really is compared to just turning up on a Wednesday evening and playing some friends. Um, so um, it was it was hard in, in terms of the availability of players. That, that was definitely our biggest struggle was um, you can have a big squad, but a big squad doesn't really mean anything. You just need to sort of bring together the the committed ones and and build a core from there. So I think in the first season we we struggled with building that that core of a team because we rarely had the same squad every every Sunday and I think that towards the end of the season had a had an impact on us. Yeah. Um so we learned from that moving into the second season um which which really helped because the second season we had a core eight, probably eight, every uh, core eight to every game, and I think that has a, a big impact um, on building momentum and building co um, confidence. So, when you were in your first season, um, how big was your squad? Would would you say? So, what kind of like was your player base that you were relying on on a week to week? Um, I mean, we had a big squad, maybe twenty to twenty five, but I think the majority of games we only had about twelve or thirteen. Yeah, um, <laughs> and I think that's the. the 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 joys of Sunday league sometimes is um, people say they're committed, but when maybe when they play Saturdays, they then decide that night they don't want to play Sundays, or people just change their change their minds overnight. Mm. So, from your point of view, do you think that twenty five in hindsight is a large number? Because I'll only say that because a lot of the, the the people that I've interviewed here always just stress you just have to keep recruiting that squad size doesn't like as you said it doesn't mean anything and that they're not happy until they get in 40 40 plus nowadays because they like to oversubscribe for this eventuality that a lot of players aren't around on a week to week i think you just have to build a core on players that are 100% committed and in the last two seasons we've had the a core eight players and it makes a big difference. In the first season, we probably had maybe five of the same players probably every week. And it, it really helped, really struggled, sorry, with momentum and building a, a team morale. So I think, it's, from my experience, it's probably more important to get a core, maybe eight to 15, um, and just rely on that. Because we have a, this season, we probably have a playing squad of 25, but I think maybe in 15, have actually actually played a game. So it just shows that there's we have a lot of players that are um, not as committed as we first thought. And you mentioned that there, it was a bit eye-opening um, for you running the club from a smaller picture doing small-sided games to running an 11-a-side game. What was, um, so speaking as a manager and a volunteer, like what I am, what was the, the major things that caught you by surprise when you first came into the Sunday League Pyramid? Um. <clears throat> I think it was more of when you rely on people when they say they're committed and then they don't turn up Sunday mornings. Mm. Um, I remember one fixture we played against a team that I think they're no longer in the league and it was 11 against 10 for 90 minutes. There was no subs, no linesmen, 
And I think that, that type of game sums up Sunday League sometimes. Yeah. Um, and we only won one nil. <laughs> so we you had the ten or eleven. We had the eleven, and we only oh. won one nil. <laughs> Um, you played at the time. I think it was RG six. I think. Oh yeah, they were um they were the whipping boys for a while. I think they dropped out of the league near the end, or they got through the season and dropped out. Bless them. We, mm. They made a mistake. They we played them in their first ever game and we beat them twelve one. At the time, it was our biggest ever win. Mm. And the start of that season, we had gone back to we were in Saturday and Sunday league. But the Saturday league hadn't started yet, so we just had a, we just had a, a hyper squad of our best players across two days mm-hmm. playing them. And in the first game, they got walloped twelve 0 and their manager said, "Yeah, this probably isn't for us." <laughs> um, yeah, and they said, "Oh, I hope that it picks up." And then they played their second game was against Reading United, who okay. ended up winning. Reading the uh, who ended up they won all twenty games in our division, and they got walloped by about another twelve, I think. And their manager said, "Okay, what league have you put us in?" <laughs> and everything. So, I I feel for them because they they really had some nice lads in their team, but they they had two games in and they were minus twenty four goal difference already. Um, and then they played a couple of the the lower teams at the bottom, and they were still losing. So I think that their manager just kind of like packed it in. Um, but one nil against them uh, um, at the time would have been quite surprising because you know they were new, they were quite young. Um, but yeah, ten against eleven is uh, it's never good. Um, we've had a lot of our games this season, um, sixteen on the day, and then twelve or thirteen are there. Some it's been some it's like legitimate they've got family issues or sometimes they're caught in traffic sometimes it's just turning up late so yeah it's very much sunday league um so um aside from the players did you struggle at all or did you have any like learning curve with any of the administration or any of the duties of care that you have to do when running a club even if it's due to like i'll give you some examples like going to committee meetings doing all of the administration on the full-time site uh, going to meetings, um, the cost of it all? Um, I used to coach a youth team for about maybe five or six years. So I think that really helped with the majority of that. Um, I don't think full-time was around when I did that because it's probably 10 plus years ago, maybe even 15 years ago. But it helped in terms of getting things into place. Um, but I managed to, yeah, I think I suppose a few people that leaked and they, they gave me um, some help so um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so when it came to um, funding the club that's always a big thing talking about how clubs get off the ground because money gets involved um, is how is Brothers funded is it done through yourself or do the team come together and pitch in um, it's it's a mixture I mean we, our main, we have a main sponsor or our only sponsor um, the original gourmet company in Wokingham Road um, and it's they, they've have um, they've been a great help with uh, our sponsorship as a, a friend and he's part of the team. Um, and then it's just other donations. Um, as we're sort of a, a community club, we do other activities. So um, we do have other um, forms of donations as well. What type of activities do you do um, in terms of fundraising? Um, I would love to hear about that. <laughs> um, so not fundraising activities, more oh, just, just activities. activities. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 We do um, some youth um, activities and and some other uh, adult activities. So um, a lot of people, um, we know a few people that donate to us because of the the, the bigger picture that we do. Of course. So um, <laughs> that's all year one, um, and I think that. Did you guys finish third or fourth in the first season that you had in the RDSL? It might have been fifth or sixth. Fifth or sixth. It, we um, the last four or five games it, we fell off a cliff really. Um, yeah. Was that just end of season? Everybody's down tools. You weren't going to win anything, or you weren't going to finish where you did. So it was a kind of let's just write it off and go again next year. Yeah, I think it was a mixture of um, a lot of things. Um, being the season, we had some better players and they left. Um, and then we we're just getting by with what we had really. Um, had a, a massive squad transition at the end of the first season, moving into the second season. Um, mm. So that's a great segue then into um, the next point. So, when you have your first year team um, going into a second year in particular, uh, talking about transitions, I'll talk about my transition from first year to second year and even third year to fourth year. 
um, at Hype Training because we had a really horrible transition in our third year. We had just won a trophy. We won our only trophy in a little stadium, a cup trophy for our Saturday team. And it just, it was the best thing that happened to us because obviously you win a trophy, everything's great, but it also was arguably the worst thing to happen to us as well because we were in a position where a lot of the, some of the players decided that that was the end, that they had no interest. We also had a lot of graduate turnovers. We had um, groups that had come in to play for a season and had left. We had some players that left because they won in the cup final team. Mm. When you play across Saturday and Sunday football and you've got a squad of 50 players and everybody is all of a sudden vying for 16 spots and you've got some injured players that are concerned that they're not going to make it in time and they're still upset that they're not in it. It just it led to about 10 or 12 people leaving because when I put the team out, I had five people leave the WhatsApp group within a week. Um, <laughs> it was completely unprecedented. Um, I've never gone for anything like that before. And yeah, just people just weren't happy that they weren't as involved. And it all comes back to what you said about availability. I had a, I pretty much had a group of 16 players for our cup competition all the way through and people were trying to like get their way in mm. and it just wasn't, it just wasn't going to happen because we just had that team for that tournament. So we just kept it the same. Um, I think we made a couple of changes for our semi-final because we had to, um, but every game we had like the same back four. Um, our goalkeeper joined us, um, Jamie, um, around the time the cup started as well. And I think that's what kind of like made us win that tournament. We didn't really have a goalkeeper. We were trialing new people and then our goalkeeper just came out of the blue. But we had in that summer when we went into what would have been our Division 3 season last season, um, the 22-23 season, we had, I kid you not, 30 people leave our WhatsApp group wow. over two days. And we all and um, what it led to was we had to cancel our Saturday season for one year and we just had to... We have a little committee, me, my brother, and a couple of the play like senior players and our captain. We all basically said, okay, we're going to have to bite the bullet. We're going to have to give up the Saturday team for a year. We're going to have to grow. We're going to have to develop again. And we're going to have to build up numbers because the club was on the verge of folding. Mm -hmm. so we, all because we had had a season of about 50 games where it culminated in us winning something. And it just, it was a poison chalice for us. It really was. Mm -hmm. We were going to have a lot of turnover anyway. But the turnover was exacerbated because we had hit some form of success. And when other people weren't included in it, that thought they should have been, it, it made my life a misery over the summer, trying to get in all of these new players. And yeah, we had to change over 30 players. We got in largely a very consistent team for last season when we were in the Division 3 with you guys, um, RE United, Southcourt. Um, and all of the other teams near the top, Woodley, Core. So yeah, it was kind of like a just a massive turnover. And I don't think it was anything to do with me or Sam, my club chairman that runs it at the time. It just it just happens. Like you know, sometimes it just happens. You have so much turnover at one time. Um, so yeah, so we kind of had that transition. Um, so talk to us about your transition then from your first year to your second year because. For me, as an outsider, there was a noticeable uptick with brothers and how they kind of like, um, yeah, like just outside the top pack in their first season. And last season, I ugly be thought you guys probably should have won the league. I thought you were very, you were so was, close to it as well. So it was heartbreaking. To, we had too many midweek games. <laughs> too many midweek games around Ramadan for a lot of players yeah. in your team that are Muslim. So, yeah, we'll obviously hard. go into that if you want to in a minute. But yeah, just... Uh, Talk to us about that transition because I don't think clubs understand what transitions are like when you go from one season to the other. It was the one thing that really caught me off guard um, in my first season because I had it in my head. When I uh, formed Hype Train, I had, it, I had this grand idea in my head that these 11 players were going to be my team. And if I could involve a few other people, that was perfect. And and the team from then to now is just completely ridiculously different, which is a good thing because you only want people that want to play for you in your team, mm. thankfully. Um, but yeah, we I had this whole set vision of okay, this is what the team's going to look like. End of story. And and it caught me off guard. It really did because I didn't come from that type of a world before. I've run a club, so yeah. Um, so the first season into the second was difficult, but like that season I mentioned going into our third season was horrifically a struggle. Uh, for, for all things 
Um, so yeah, sorry, I've probably nattered on a bit. But yeah, talk to me about your experience then, like kind of what you went through uh, trying to get that team up and running for the second season. Yeah, it was it was a difficult summer. Um, I think in late August, we barely scraped five players for the deadline um, for the registration. And then the players just came out of the blue. Um, I think in sort of word of mouth in, in our community or in the area, people find out, oh, we've got, we got a team going. And more players sort of was interested in and came on board. Um, we had one of the um, original players back from the fir- start of the first season, and I think that really helped us. Um, and we, we just took off from there, and we started some preseason games, and we just kept building. I think just the transition of um, just getting on social media, maybe, and, and telling people that we have a team, get onto the WhatsApp groups, sort of um, putting on the stories of of, of, our, um, of our games and. People say, like, yeah, well, I want to get involved. And it sort of transitioned from there. So when you had your five players in August, um, just before the deadline, because uh, for, for, the, for the listeners at home, the Sunday League over here in Reading make you submit, I think it's up to between like five and eight players, somewhere between that range, players where you need to basically register so that um, you just don't get a fine because they just want to make sure that every team's actually got players. Mm. Um, so when you're at that stage early August and the season's a month away, what's kind of like going on in your head? Are you thinking that there's even going to be a team at that point? Or like, would you um, have any doubts? Because I would have doubts big time if I only had five players like committed at the time, like, oh my God, I'd be a bit nervy. <laughs> I mean, all, all of us were sort of on holiday during the deadline. So we were more of um, distracted, which I think is maybe uh, might be helpful. And then... Um, we, we just met, did a makeshift team for a preseason friendly just to get um, the team moving. And it sort of took off from there, um, which really helped. And being on social media, um, going on to Instagram and kind of like putting yourselves out there a lot more. Um, I, a lot of clubs don't use social media. And I, I'm always like scratching my heads as to why, mm. um, because it's the, that I feel like it's like a necessity now. Most players that, in my, especially younger players, look at um, all of the Instagram pages first and foremost to see if anybody's posting anything. Um, and the club players are a lot more savvy and well connected than what we think. I'm sure of it. Like I've got a player in my team called Kai, um, a new player this year. He seems to know every player, every team, every manager. And, and, and I ask him, "How do you do it?" He's like, "Oh, I just go online. I just, I just." I'm just on. I just, I just know what's going on on WhatsApp. I just know what's going on on Instagram, and everything. Yeah, and he just as a perusal once in a while. He just seems to know. He's a lot of players just are really well connected. They just seem yeah. to know and understand a lot more maybe than what we do because my head's another way trying to organise things, <clears> and the players look at it in their own little way and see certain things that I don't. So, yeah. So going onto social media, um, was that ever something that you guys wanted to do? Um, because you were a group of friends or was it a case of you thought, okay, we're going to have to because we need to recruit, we need to promote, we need to get our club out there, we need to preserve ourselves? It, it sort of it evolved. And more and more teams sort of get online um, and you sort of want to have that presence as well, um, which, which which only can benefit um, uh, the team. Um, and... Yeah, so you guys also on your Instagram stories do um, st- you do some live stories or some live footage of your games? Um, who's behind uh, all of that on the game days? Is that yourself or another member of the team? No, it's someone else. Um, I usually run the line. Um, yeah, we have a few spectators sometimes. Um, they're, they're mainly um, video just for the, the banter, um, but it's, it's a good way to um, to promote the team as well. Yeah, of course. Um, so um, heading into the second season, you've got your team and everything's running smoothly. Um, for the sakes of the audience at home, I'll post the Division 3 table come the end of the season. Um, and Ari United won it on the final day. And I think Southcote finished in second place and yourselves in third. But we're talking here about the most razor wire finish I've ever seen in a season where I think you've missed out by a single point um, I, I, and everything off the top of my head, I think RE maybe got 59 or 58 points and then the league was one on goal difference. And then you were one point behind. 
Um, we're, we're going into the last game against Southcote. If we won the game, we won the league. If we drew, we came second. If we lost, we came third. Oh, so um, um, do you want and, to open that can of worms? <laughs> um, I mean, it was a great season um, in terms of like team morale and performances, but we just had too many cancellations. And in the space of the last month or two, we had maybe seven or eight midweek games. We had a cup final. And then after the cup final, we had a game on that Sunday. So it's less than two days later. So it was all, it was all just too many fixtures um, to play at once. And I think that just helped, uh, lacked the, 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 the edge that you need in the game sometimes. So when were the majority of your games called off? Um, and again, I'll stress to the viewers at home, we had a, quite a rainy season. So the season in grassroots runs from September until um, December. And what we had this summer was we had the season delayed because there was the heat wave mm. in August. So the season was delayed until the penultimate weekend of September, which limited the amount of games we had in a 13-team division. So you're supposed to play 24 games. We had a super hot season. and then. I don't think any teams played in December because there was five weeks of rain. We waited about six weeks to play South Bank in a County Cup game. And wow. it went all the way from the end of November uh, or the start of December to the penultimate week of January. Some And every week was rained off, every mm. single week. And yeah, it was... Uh, so yeah, so um, from there you have the season that then... Um, goes from the first week of Jan after Christmas all the way until the end of April because of all the heat wave and all the lack of games and the rain cancelling every game in Feb and March you're kind of left in May and brothers were kind of left in a position where um, they had so few games played that they were doing Tuesday Wednesday Sunday Tuesday Wednesday Sunday um, so what tell me about what it was like as an administrator and as a member of the club, trying to get a team together every other day, pretty much for about six weeks of the season. Um, um, I think the hunger on, on with the team, I think the opportunity of winning the league was probably the only reason we got through it. It's because of the hunger. Everyone was hungry to win the league. Um, if the league wasn't an opportunity, I don't know what it would have been like. Um, so it was just the hunger of... Um, of the potential and we looking back on it we should have won the league it was it was very disappointing um we also lost in the cup final which was disappointing um but it, it was it was difficult um maintaining um the same 11 because we had other players that played on a Saturday team so they were playing in the days between so it was always hard to um uh, maintain a full squad and um, so how many, so with your schedule um, as well, the, um, I just want to ask about Ramadan during this period because Ramadan took place over this period and a lot of your players, I believe, are Muslim, having spoken mm. to a lot of them. Did Ramadan have an effect on your team as well? Because the games in midweek in particular were being asked to be played at 6pm, which is right at the twilight end of the first <laughs> period. So did that have an impact on your games in these midweek periods as well? Um, we actually managed to um, delay all our midweek games until after. Um, oh, okay. But uh, uh, every person is different. Sometimes they prefer an evening game when they're fasting. Some people prefer the morning game when they're fasting. Those four games we had in in um, in Ramadan, one game we, we beat RE United 5-0, which was a, a shocker. And then the, the two other three other games we drew against the bottom three teams, so it was a very mixed of a um, of, of of a period. And then looking back, that was probably one of the reasons why we maybe lost the league. Uh, it's just dropping too many points against teams where realistically you should be thumping at least five nil. The one the one game that I looked at was your nil nil draw against New England. Um, who I don't think had kept a clean sheet all season. Uh, they were near the bottom of the table. Dan Newbury that runs them. I used to play for New England. I think he's a great lad, but they were going for a bit of a transition last year, so mm. was struggling as well. I couldn't believe when I saw that nil nil come through. Um, I had assumed it was it, it was rather than them employing Superman to play for them on the day that it was 
something to do with your guys having like a pair 11 because you were in the middle of that horrendous yeah. schedule um, as well. So may- maybe it was a day like that that cost you the league um, because the South Cook game was there for you to potentially just take it all. So you were still in that position, but games like that where you're going through the muds, going through the trenches, maybe you've been where you guys had uh, ultimately ended up on the on the uh, third place on the podium, unfortunately. Yeah, we, we just drew too many games. I think we only lost two games. And I think both of them were against Southcote. Um, and we just, just, just drew too many, too many games. And um, it's hard to keep up that mentality and, and sharpness when you're when we had so many fixtures it was it was very difficult and sandwiched in between all of this was your run to the rdsl and industrial cup final um mm. where you played westwood in the final down at scours lane um at the rivermore stadium uh so talk to me about your journey to the final and the final itself being not only within this period but as an experience for you guys potentially winning your first trophy as a club and kind of like that whole process. Cause it's always good from my point of view where clubs, cl- cup runs are special. Mm, yes. Even if you don't win them, sometimes being in that position it, it alone is special enough. Talk to me a bit about your experience going through that, getting to a cup final, um, arguably against a very good Westwood team at the time in division two. Yeah, it was a really good run. We, we had some nice fixtures and some of the leagues all about who turns up on the day sometimes. Um, a lot of our games were against uh, the division higher. Um, and on the day, we were just unbelievable. And I think um, that that helped. And at the beginning of the season, where a lot of those games were, the morale was really strong. Um, and it was it was really good. And, and on, on the, in the cup final day, a lot, a lot of our players, that was the first time they experienced um, something like that, where you're at a, a stadium, um, there's something to play for now. And um, we um, we missed a penalty when they were one nil down, and I think that as um, l- looking back on it, obviously every every moment in the game can change things. Um, but after the game, we all were proud. I mean, a year before that, we, we just started as a new team, and then the year after, we get to a cup final. Um, so it, it was a proud proud day, and arguably Westwood, they were. Um, they they were probably on paper definitely the stronger team by finishing. I think they already won the league at that point as well. Um, they had, they had, yeah. Um, they had won it very early in their division. Um, so so all, they'd won it the week before, so they were on a high. Yeah. Um, so they could just purely focus on that one effort for the cup final. And I think you guys played four games after them before the cup final in like in, in mm. eight days. Um, yeah, I think that was kind of the schedule. You guys had to play a couple of midweek games literally a few days before the cup final, um, if I believe, on the Tuesday, the Sunday before, the Thursday, the Tuesday before as well. Um, do you guys think that if you didn't have that hectic schedule that you would have been in a better position to have won the final? Or was the final always kind of going to go that way? Because Westwood are a good team. They were arguably uh, placed in the wrong division um, because their first team dropped out mm. of the Prem and they yeah. put all of their players down there. So it isn't, so yeah, the, you were always going to have your, you know, the cards were always, you know, against you guys in the first place. Cause you know, the, the he were they had to qualify for that final because, because of, well, they were too good for the division. So it's yeah. as that um, to begin with, but do you guys think that given that you were the underdogs anyway, that the, um, a lighter schedule leading up to it would have at least given you guys a breather to be able to focus a little bit more on it? Or, um, I think in terms of the league, it had a negative impact. But I think for the cup final, um, it helped with the morale because we were seeing people every other day. Um, so there was a point where it, the morale did improve um, going into that game. Um, yeah, I mean, it didn't help playing on the Tuesday before the final. Um but that's something that wasn't really in our control. Mm. And uh, for a game like that, when you've got a cup final three days away, are your players terrified about putting in a challenge or potentially getting like doing something that might have them uh, well injured or suspended or just something from a final? Was there any type of trepidation heading into that game before thinking, oh my God, I could end up being injured. I could pull a hammy in the first minute. I don't know. Mm. Uh, was there any of that 
trepidation or fear factor going into it thinking oh or was it or was it the lads was super professional because yeah some teams would have sacrificed a game potentially to be in that position but you guys were firing on all fronts with about 10 games left to go <laughs> yeah we as as we had the league as well to play for mm. um everyone wanted them both both everyone wanted them both equally so yeah, all the league games around that we were pushing hard to win the game as well because we knew that we could win the league and even potentially win the cup if we didn't have the league in contention um then yeah you, everyone's everyone's eyes are going to be on the cup final um, but at that point in the season, we knew if we win all our games, we won the league. Um, and I think maybe the pressure just was a bit too strong in the end. Yeah, the, a cup final. I think you can. It, it happens sometimes. Uh, you know, cup finals can be just a moment. I don't feel like you really feel. I've played in a couple of cup finals, and you don't feel it in your body that you're fatigued. It's a mental thing sometimes. Mm. And cup finals can go for you and they can go against you. In our very first Sunday like outing as a club, we formed... Well, when COVID happened, we were in the RSSL, which ourselves and Caversham started. And somehow we got to the final. It was the first time we've ever played Sunday League. We played Woodley Saints in the final and they had the best 10 minutes ever. They, they went 1-0 up and they had a few shots that scared us. And then after that, I think we have missed some absolute sitters. A header from a yard out. Um, just uh, just any type of chance in football that you miss, we missed it. And then we got a penalty with about 10 minutes to go and we missed it. And the game finished 1-0. We put the squeeze on. There was an offside goal, I think. It was just relentless pressure and we ended up losing. And And then the following year afterwards, we actually won a cup final because we actually learned from that experience. So hopefully you guys are in a position where same shoe on the same foot, you can say, okay, this worked last season, this worked, this worked, this worked, this didn't. And then you can kind of like go to the drawing board and say, okay, so this is what we're going to be doing this year to improve on last year. So the fact that you guys were quite literally on the goal line for both of the league and the cups means that hopefully this year, you're not going to be too far away from matching or beating those objectives as again. Um, and yeah, it just happens in a cup final. Um, mm. And I, I don't want to draw on too much about the league because I don't, I don't know how much PTSD you have over um, <laughs> the, the final league game. But yeah, you played Southcott on the final day of the season. Um, talk to me about that. What was the score in the game? Was it a close game or? No. No. <laughs> I can't remember the final score, to be honest. Uh, um, no, okay. It was one of those days where it just wasn't going for you. Because yeah. um, see the city free kick see the city goal and it just sort of built up from there um um yeah it's just one of those one of those days um this fixture kept being postponed as well we're supposed to play it before the cup final and then it got pushed back um yeah it's just one of those Sunday league games um you just we just didn't turn up of course so that is the second season so you were the nearly men um you were the benfica when benfica got to three cup finals and they could have won their league and it just fell away on the final day um so i do have you do have my sympathy for a lot of that um but it shows that you guys were on the right track and now this season um in your third season you guys got elevated into division two um, even though you didn't finish in the top two, the Sunday League, but three teams up, yourself, Southcote and RE, who ultimately won the league. Um, and now you're in Division 2. Um, I'll be honest and open. Um, Brothers played us um, about a month ago um, at Calcott, where we have our home games. And um, simultaneously, you had your best day, I think, as a club, big 9-0 win. And you said to me before the podcast, it was a, your best team. And on the show on the side of our foot, we had, we had a horror day, nine nil loss. It was one one to write off um, completely for us. But it was a county cup game, so thankfully the end result was that we didn't have too much pressure on our backs because of it wasn't a league game or the industrial cup in our league as well. Um, so yeah, brothers are now in Division Two, and just talk to me about your season so far. And if you want to talk about thrashing us nine nil then you've got my consent because uh you know it doesn't happen every day i usually wouldn't invite somebody on that's just uh tanked us nine nil but in the spirit of the game i thought yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's been um we had a bad start of the season 
um, we lost to give back. Um, just, I think just a slow start to the season. But I think we're unbeaten since since then, and we're having a good season so far. Um, unfortunate with um, the weather, it's been a, a few cancellations already, which we're a bit nervous about because um, we don't want a repeat of last season. Um, but it's been positive so far. We get, we get, we're playing the football, which which, which is important for us. Um, obviously, you want to win games. Um, but we want to have fun and, and do it in the right way. Mm. So this process now where um, this podcast is being filmed at the beginning of November for people that are interested, it's going to be airing a couple months later. Um, and we're at that stage now where we're about five, six, seven games in. Um, I think you guys have played four, four or five, something around that. Mm. And yeah, so we're kind of heading into um, the wintry months where games are going to get cancelled. We've had three weeks of just persistent rain. Um, our game was on last week somehow the last week it got rained off um, so yeah we're kind of now back in that position again where we're thinking how many games are we going to be playing in April um, in terms of how you're playing and the development of the squad in particular you've already kind of like touched on it but do you mind going into some detail about getting it right on the pitch because from my experience brothers have always been quite a techie team touch move touch move like to keep the ball like to switch the play how long has that taken for you guys to develop over a period of time? Um, I think it also goes down to quality of the players. Um, our players, they're confident on the ball. So they're confident with a long pass or they're confident with a short pass and sort of spinning and going to another direction. Um, in training, we always focus on just holding the ball and playing around, switching the play if we need to, um, and then looking for that that pass um, in, in between. So um, I think it works really well because we have the, the players that can do it. We have quick, quick forwards and our midfielders, and they're good at passing. So I think it's a, it's a good combination. Hmm. And in terms of Sunday league, you don't find many teams that like to play out. They're comfortable on the ball. It seems to be some teams play route one. They play um, percentages in the box. They go for set pieces um, why did you guys decide to go down this route? Because you were doing these same things in season one, even now in season three. Um, is this down to your management of the team, or is this the way, or are you being guided by what the players want to do on the pitch as well? So yeah, our season's been um, about just pass and move, pass and move. Um, Must have for the, uh, the the player coach. Um, just prefers playing, playing, playing the ball on the floor, um, and moving the ball that way, um, and enjoying enjoying the football while while we're doing it. Um, I think it's important as well um, to play. Even um, obviously, winning is the most important thing. I uh, think we all know that, but it's always nice to play good football as well. There are teams out there that, that grind wins in other ways, um, but we we like to. Um, have fun while, while we play football. Yeah, of course. So with all of the on-field stuff, that's perfect. It's all good. I, I, I think everybody's in agreement uh, in the Sunday league scene that you guys are rocketing up the leagues very quickly and you're doing it the right way. I've not come across anybody that said, you know, oh, this team of this or this team of that. They've dropped down a team, three divisions to play in a lower division. It's nice to see a team actually being able to build themselves up from the bottom upwards which is what I feel like teams need to do largely mm. when they're new. Um, in the case of Westwood or other teams that drop down, I think, you know, that's just pretty shameful that teams do it, to be honest. I don't understand why they uh, need the urge to do it, why they need to drop down. Richfield did it last year in Division 4. They got put in Division 4 and just walked. Uh, they walked to the John Lostard Cup. Um, they thankfully didn't win the league um, and everything. But yeah, they... You know, I don't like it when teams do that. So it's always nice to hear success stories um, on the other foot. Um, just changing gears a little bit, I do want to uh, pick your brain about what you think the biggest challenges are in football at the moment for grassroots clubs, because obviously we're all living and breathing it on a week-to-week -week basis. And um, even though administrators, we don't talk about it religiously to each other, there are problems or good things that go on as well. So I'll start off by asking what you think the biggest challenge is for teams like yourselves or ours or anyone in this 
same thing playing on the basement level of football what we're going through and if you've experienced any challenges as now that you're heading into your third year i think keeping 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 everyone happy is always difficult um you go into a game and you can only play 11 players so if you have a score of 15 or 20 it's hard to pick a team or hard to tell people that you're you're not playing i think that's what um we found difficult at times is um, we had to be loyal to the players that I play every single week because they're going to be there regardless of the weather, they're going to be there um, to, in, in reward to them being loyal, um, we have to um, reward them by, by putting them into the 11. Um, so I, it, is, it is sometimes hard to have the balance, especially when it's friends um, and sometimes their mentality of playing is, is maybe not necessarily to win but more to have fun. Uh, but sometimes it, football is all about re- winning. You can have it's, it's always good to have fun, but if you're losing all your games, you're not really having fun. Um, so um, people's mentality was slightly different or harder to come across or harder to adjust um, to what the team needed. Um, and it, that's part of the transition as well, is just making sure the players know that... Um, Every week we 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 would pick the 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 best players that are, um, that are committed. So for players that turn around to you and say, "Oh, I can only play once this month and then twice next month," do you do you have to be quite frank with them to say, "Look, you've got X, Y, and Z who are here, rain or shine." Yeah, they have to take priority, and then you guys can just fit around depending on what we need for the week. Is that kind of how you do it? Yeah, in a way, and also training. People think they can get away with not coming to training and start on, mm-hmm. start on the Sunday morning. And the, the, the team is 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 a commitment, and and it's, it's bigger than an individual. So um, it's, it's important to have that that team policy. Whereas if you're not going to be consistent, maybe one game a month, that one game you come, you're going to be on the bench and improve. Then that that you're good enough to start and. And so show more commitment. In terms of training, um, I'll be honest with you and the podcast audience. We've been struggling with our training this year um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the prices at JMA have gone up astronomically where we tra- train and it's kind of pricing people out. They've made it harder for us to book sessions. Instead of doing a weekly booking of um, X amount of money, they've increased the price and then said, you can only pay a whole month in advance. So it locks us in for that month. And if we're having one week where we're struggling, we just lose the money. And it's such a big amount of money. It's literally just under a hundred pounds for a, for an hour on half of a 4G pitch. Um, yeah, we, we, and we've taken a break from training because of that exact thing. Um, the cost doesn't, it doesn't justify doing it at the mm. moment it really doesn't so I, for the first time ever in five years i'm sat, i'm going to be sat at home tomorrow on a wednesday well i'll probably be at the gym or doing something else but it's the first time that we as a club haven't actively trained for five or six years um well since 2019 so four or five years now that we haven't every week wednesday we've been on it training every week and this is the first period where i've got players that aren't either interested or the just the general cost of the session doesn't out it doesn't compute because they want so much up front and it's kind of like strangle holding me um so i'm in a very delicate position like going into the new year what i want to do to train um out of interest where do you guys do your training um i mean we train on a small side of pitch ah so uh, five, um, do you train five aside pitches is that correct? yeah well it, yeah six aside but we push it to seven aside hmm. um sometimes eight aside um because like I said, it's hard to find the lemon side pitches that are cheap. Um, last season, we were training in Wokenham, um, and the distance was a bit too was just a bit too far. But it was the only place that was available on a lemon side three G. Um, but this year, it became more difficult to book that. Um, so we're just training on a small side of pitch in in Britain, um, which is difficult at times because you can't do certain drills um but i'm also at the same time that may might, might be why we're good at passing because that's the only thing that we can really practice is is our passing 
Yeah. So do you uh, train in a cage or is yeah. It, um, yeah. So cage football is very much um, about physicality, shape, passing the ball quickly. Mm. Um, and I can kind of see that comes out in your play on a bigger pitch as well. We train on half a four. We train on half an 11 side pitch. We got very lucky with our booking and the timing. And we're one of the ones that like what you said, where we got a booking and the booking agencies are just slowly pricing us all out. Um, everyone is super struggling to pay the debts and the fees that they want up front. Um, so it's becoming a case now that even if you want a 11 a side pitch, like a big open area to train on, good luck affording it. That's the other thing. I mean, we're super well organized and well run behind the scenes here at Hype Training. Even we're struggling. And, you know, I will invest as much money as I can to try to make the team a success. But when it's £500 this month, £500 the next month, it just snowballs so quickly. And sometimes it's not worth the, the hassle and it's not worth that deviation. So we're kind of like hitting our heads against a brick wall about what's doing in the long term. And maybe moving to a smaller sided pitch and just working on, you know, quick touches, quick movement, stuff like that you guys are doing might probably be the way that teams move forward in the future if they're transitioning from what we're doing because a lot of teams that i speak with do what you do they do the small sided stuff they do easy five ten yard passes five aside games five aside leagues and that's kind of like what happens i spoke to a new manager um barkham united in our division and he said his team don't train but they get involved in small sided football in the week um it's mostly to do with like commitment issues with parenting and everything like that so late people that work late people that are parents so yeah but it just seems to be training is one thing that makes my head explode on a week to week at the moment um and that's why i think teams do it now they do they get 10 people to turn up 10 12 maybe 14 if they can push it in a cage and it's no stress no hassle and they know exactly what they need to do on a week to week so yeah, I mean, uh, oh, it's a hard one. Aside from that, um, do you go through any challenges running brothers um, as a team, or or, or is it quite? Uh, so, do you have any support running the club? I have a twin brother, so it's easy for me to lean on somebody if I need it. Um, do you guys have a support structure at the club that helps you get by if you ever need it? Yeah, I mean, we have a, 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 a sort of a, a small, small group of people that sort of help run it. Um, Mustafa is. Um, is a, a lot. A lot of the team is with, he, he. He founded really. I'm just the admin guy, um, and he's the the, player, the the manager or the the coach that deals with the players and having the player relationships and making sure we get 15 players on a match day. Um, so obviously he's a big big driving force as well. Um, but behind the scenes, we have a few other people as well um, that help out. Um, even more so when there's a bill to pay and. Um, sometimes um, we need to come together and stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's not just me behind the scenes. There, there are definitely a few others um, that get involved. Mm-hmm. And of course, um, so in regards to all of this, um, kind of like what we've been leading to is the development of brothers. We've talked a lot about your experiences year on year. Um, so what do you guys see as like a five-year plan or like... Um, a plan for the next two to three years. Um, are you? Do you have internal goals that you're setting with the team, or is it just go season by season? Or yeah, kind of what do you see as that big picture at the moment? Um, it's a mixture of two. I mean, season by season in terms of um, the progression. Um, I think at the start of last season, um, we hoped to win the league. I mean, I think everyone starts season with that ambition anyway. Um, so I think uh, election was a possibility or it was leading to that anyway. Um, I think we're going to push more some off-field activities as well. Um, as a sort of a, a community team, we do some other community activities. So, um, when we're looking to push more of those, um, and with the football, just sort of driving through the leagues, um, where we can really, I think. Um, our team's developing in, in, in a positive way. Um, and if, if, if um, we, we get, get the, um, the right um, um, recruitment again, we may be even looking at push, pushing for um, the, the league again. 
Do you think that you guys are going to be in a position this season to challenge or be in a position where you're um, going to be near the top of the table again? Um, who do you think are the main contenders at the moment in Division 2? Um, I mean, we, 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 we are aiming to, uh, to challenge for the title. Um, I think um, I think about reserves at the top of the league already, I think, at the moment. So I think, obviously, they're, they're, they'll be up there as one of the favourites. Um there's a few other uh, good teams as well in, in, in our group. Um, but some, it's something the league sometimes. So you do, if you just turn up on the day, um, you can get the result. Um, some of the fixtures or some of the results this season have been been surprising. Um, so we just have to maintain um, our performances and put, push through, really, I think. Of course. And if you... Um, so let's say somebody outside of football has come to you and said, oh, James, I'm really looking to start my own team or get involved, be either a club volunteer or like a coach or just somebody that wants to be involved in football, potentially wants to start their own team. What type of advice would you give somebody or like what would you what wisdoms would you give somebody that's looking to kind of like get involved in football for the first time? Um, because you, you've gone through that process with a group of friends as well. So. Mm. Kind of what would you like? Are there any pitfalls or any suggestions that you would give people to help benefit them if they were going to do their own thing? I think discipline is important with players. Finding the players that are disciplined and um, that are reliable. Um, as I said before, there's no one having a, a 20, 30 man squad if you're struggling to um, get consistency with with the players. So I think finding a a core eight to fifteen players that you know you can you can rely on. 95% of the time. Um, I think that's very important. Also have financial support as well. It's, it's not... Um, I think maybe maybe a lot of people don't realise what actually goes involved in funding and creating a football club. Um, obviously the kits, the, the equipment, the training facilities, match day facilities, you know, referees, league fees. There's, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. So I think having a uh, financial backing as well and having a little team that, like maybe like a committee or like a group that, that run the team, I think it'd be very difficult for one person just, just to run a whole team. I think it's, it's definitely um, at least two to three person um, um, task. Uh, that's for sure. Oh, I, I definitely agree on the last point. Uh, I do a lot of the admin for Hype Train and I need support, even if it's just somebody to lend me an ear for five yeah. minutes or for me to bounce an opinion off because uh, if you're playing table tennis by yourself you're not gonna you, nobody's gonna return the serve and it's yeah. not gonna be fun and yeah so i always think it's I, I i feel like the financial stuff is obviously the big one and i think with the cost of living at the moment it's the the what will drive it but what i feel like people don't understand about grassroots football in particular is just just the level of effort that people like ourselves put into it on a weekly mm. basis. It's the mental thing every week. I wake up on a Monday and think about 50 things that are going to happen at the weekend and things that have happened just at the weekend, all like from a learning experience. You've got mm. a checklist of admin that you need to do. And sometimes I feel like people that get into it don't understand sometimes the graft. They don't either want to do it or they're incapable of doing it and they they kind of come into it blind and then get surprised why they've got 15 things that they need to do a week to attend a committee meeting from the league or uh, do some admin online, um, provide a report about a referee. I, I think that people go in so underprepared for that assignment that sometimes when they get faced with adversity, it's easy for them to throw their arms up and say, oh, it's easy just to walk away. And particularly yeah. with the amount of teams that come and go one season wonder teams that just they they're there for a year and then they just have enough because behind the scenes they just they can't be asked they're in debt um a lot of their players were unreliable and then they kind of like by the end of the first year they get to grips of exactly what it takes to run a team and then they think oh what's the point what is the point and yeah that's kind of like that's there's a lot of sunday teams that come in and out uh, and they come and fold. We've been a big beneficiary of a team folding uh, for our Sunday team this year. Um, we've been able to pick up a lot of the players um, from a team that were folded because they didn't have structure. We had the structure, but didn't have the players. So it was kind of like a match made in heaven for us. But yeah, it just, I don't feel like people understand the gravity sometimes of what it takes when 
you're in that position where you care a little bit more and sometimes they yeah it's easy to be taken advantage of as a club administrator or as a manager um because players don't understand that you need you fit you need their subs you need everything in a quick and timely manner and yeah there's some players want you to run on their clock and getting them aligned is uh is a big ask sometimes um yeah especially because we do saturday and sunday football we have twice as many players and twice as much headaches for me on a daily basis and yeah it's just um clubs get through this phase quite easily once they kind of like get through it but it's just that initial shock of oh my god what am i i, I didn't realize it's a lot of admin and actual administration so yeah that's uh yeah a lot of registering players a lot of dealing with yellow cards a lot of explaining to players the rules um and communicating yeah um yeah and the the only other thing i will mention is uh i feel like clubs need to communicate a lot more uh, or, or like the way that people communicate to their players they evolve and they learn and they grow and develop i'm i'm assuming that when you started to where you are now you are a lot sharper with your communication you understand the game a lot more so you're able to uh flex knowledge on players and understand the rules and you're just a little bit more fluent with how you communicate i'm assuming that's the case yes um it it definitely is and and just sort of knowing or sensing players availability as well i think in the first season we had players that said yeah yeah i'm fully committed and then you know i hear from them for two three months Hmm. so learning and sort of picking up on on players and sort of building from there i think that's a an important factor as well um it's 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 knowing your team as well and building the trust as well um with the players of course um and aside from that um we've had a long talk um it's getting late on in the uk whilst we're filming i think this is the latest i've filmed a podcast so far um and everything so yeah it's uh I, f- I will say we'll leave it there. What I'll do for you, James, is I'll put uh, the brother's Instagram page below. I'll also put a link to the uh, Gourmet Kitchen as well that sponsors the club. And yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's always nice to speak to another friendly face in Sunday League um, and everything. I will just leave by letting you um, say one final thing about what could be that you aim for the season. Um, you know, just what you want to, uh, where you think brothers are going to be come this time in a year as you continue development but i just want to say thanks for taking your time and being involved in the podcast today and hopefully i'm going to get everybody in the sunday league scene on here sooner or rather than later <laughs> yes yeah, so thanks thanks for um having the team on um so we appreciate that and yeah we're just after after last season's ending i think the hunger is definitely strong in us um to push on this season so we're um, we're hoping for a, uh, a high-end finish that's for sure Perfect. And uh, yeah, thank you for having us on. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> no, I'm getting tongue tied. Thank you for coming on today, and we'll see everybody next time. Rounding out the 13th edition of the Hype Train podcast on my own, I would just like to say a warm thank you to James for taking his time today to speak to me. It's always a privilege to speak to somebody within the Reading football scene in grassroots football that deals with the day-to-day administration of a football club. There was some particularly good advice that James gives to new clubs that he would offer, as well as talking about the process from getting brothers from a Div 4 team to a Div 3 team to a Div 2 team. And I'm not joking they're a really good club on the rise i feel like they're going to be in division one next season they're going to challenge for their league and in the long term they're going to be a team that's pushing for the premier division in the reading sunday league which is if you don't know the reading sunday league isn't on any type of a pyramid no sunday leagues are and what you find is that the top divisions are just stacked full of really really strong teams typically they're semi-pro or below and some very good friends that make up these teams so it's a really good opportunity for this brothers team to develop and i feel like they're not too far away from being in that type of upper echelon of teams in the reading scene hopefully ourselves we can get into a position like that as well though every team has different development curves where 
teams go like this they can stutter they can go back up again so it just it's all about timing it's all about patience it's about building community uh, James kept saying that building community building trust building players he was very fixated on talking about player availability and building up a core bunch of players so it's a very good insight about what goes through his head it particularly when it comes to running or administrating the team on a game day as well aside from that i just again would like to say thank you for everybody for watching the podcast um, it's a pleasure to have everybody viewing this for new viewers for returning viewers and for everybody figuring out that there's a grassroots football podcast on youtube that you can view for free every fortnight on our channel we would like to remind people to subscribe to the channel grassroots football clubs need all the support that they can get and it would be much appreciated if you could like the video give us a comment below and again follow brothers below i've linked their twitter and i've linked some of their sponsors and all of the detail for hype train and all of our teams are listed below we've got a lot more coming up on the podcast as well we've just reviewed um, and gone into some depth about our video camera and some of the challenges we have particularly when it's raining when there's giant heat strokes going on um, just some of the complications with our team sometimes when we're filming and some of the alternatives that we go into as well we've also had some great interviews just passed with Nikhil Garg at Hounslow Wolves and again here with James today and yeah we're going to be building up to soon our 14th and 15th episodes we're going to be running all the way through until the summer until the end of the season um, and then we're going to have a short pause before the start of the season again as we recollect ourselves so that i can have some peace and quiet and i can go again and yeah apart from that as ever until next time believe the hype